Yeah, as announced, uh, this talk's going to be hopefully much shorter than the other one. Uh, it's about the Hubbard U parameter and how we can calculate it from first principles using a method called constrained random face approximation. Uh, why would you be interested in it? Well, if you're interested in uh, strongly correlated materials. So these are materials which have partially filled d orbitals or partial, partially filled f orbitals, uh, then it can happen that the electronic correlation is so uh, big, uh, strong, that uh, the DFT-LDA approach or GW uh, might not be sufficient and you would like to go to a different set of theories or approaches which are more uh, model-based, based on the Hubbard model, for example. Well, LDA plus U is a little bit a hybrid be between the two worlds, <coughs> Hubbard 1, LDA plus DMFT, LDA plus Goodsvilla, and so on. <coughs> then one very often talks about this uh, uh, ratio, the Hubbard U parameter, divided by the bandwidth as a measure for electronic correlation. So if, you are, if this uh, ratio is very small, then you have, for example, alkali metals or transition metals, and here we can uh, safely use DFT or GW. However, if the, this measure is uh, large, then you have rather uh, strongly correlated materials, for example, transition metal oxides and also rare earths. So how can we understand it? Well, again, I would like to start out with something that you know, the many-body electronic Schrödinger equation with the kinetic energy, external potential, electron-electron interaction. This a uh, differential equation cannot be solved exactly as you know, but so we have to apply approximation. So there might be two strategies of do that, doing that. The first strategy is, okay, I take that Hamiltonian operator and try to approximate or simplify it. And then you have approaches like Hartree-Fock or density functional theory with these particular approximations, also uh, GW and so on. The other strategy would be I would like to keep as much of the physics that is contained in the Hamiltonian as possible, but I just allow for reduction of the system. So I simplify the system rather. Or in other words, I single out a certain number of electrons, for example, the electrons um, located in, in localized D states. I treat them differently than the rest of the system. I make a partitioning of the system, and that's called downfolding the Hamiltonian so I identify uh, two um, parts of the Hilbert space, the correlated subspace that I treat differently from the rest. And then you have uh, approaches like LDA plus U, LDA plus DMFT, LDA plus Goodsvilla, and so on. So in practice, again, to remind you, that was the many-body Schrödinger equation in a familiar form that's called first quantization. I can write the same many-body Schrödinger equation in a form that looks completely differently, but it's exactly the same thing. Um, and somehow it even looks a little bit more complicated than the first line. However, we have some formal simplifications here in the sense that uh, in the first line we have a number of very different operators. We have a kinetic operator, we have this uh, um, multiplication with the external potential and we also have two particle operators here. In the second line we only have two different operators, namely uh, an annihilation operator C and a creation operator C dagger. They simply annihilate a particle from a many-body system or add a particle to a many-body system and it's mathematically very easily defined how they would for example act on a Slater determinant. And also, well, the complexity of the operators here are incorporated then only in these uh, matrix elements here. These are just complex numbers and are usually high dimensional uh, integrations over uh, these uh, operators up here, but they are mathematically clearly defined. But still, I mean, we haven't really gained so much. Uh, we still don't know how to solve that exactly. We have to use a simplification there. And one way, as I've mentioned it, 
uh, downfolding the Hamiltonian. And for example, to the extent that we only uh, limit uh, the system to a single band, then for example, we have the one band Hubbard model, which contains uh, three terms in the Hamiltonian. <coughs> we have a hopping term that incorporates only uh, nearest neighbor hopping. Then we have an on-site single particle term and the electron-electron interaction term, which is derives from this part. The uh, middle term is actually uh, not so important. Um, this simply defines the energy zero, the energy scale, and one could even put it to zero. And then we are left only with two parameters, the hopping parameter and the Hubbard U parameter. And uh, you can easily see that uh, there is only actually one independent parameter because we can just divide by T then we have u over t, and also we would scale then all energies by t. And this is how uh, you've, well, how this uh, uh, measure of correlation that you've seen before is uh, motivated, namely the, the Hubbard u parameter divided by t. Okay, but what is this Hubbard u parameter now? Is it one of those, or is it perhaps an average of those parameters? That is not so, because uh, we should still keep in mind there is also a rest of the system. Uh, we have separated the Hilbert space into a correlated subspace and the rest, and they, the, the rest also includes electrons. And these electrons can um, take part in the electronic screening. So whenever two electrons interact with each other in the correlated subspace, they do not do so with a bare Coulomb interaction, but with an effective interaction that includes the screening processes that are created by the rest of the electronic system. So therefore, uh, the Hubbard U parameter contains a lot of the complexity of the full many-body problem. Whereas the hopping parameter is relatively straightforward to calculate, it is the Hubbard U parameter that makes it a bit more complicated here. And uh, this talk is about calculating this Hubbard U parameter from first principles. But first, perhaps as an example, how would we want to uh, separate the Hilbert space into a localized or strongly correlated subspace and the rest? And here is an example. Uh, uh, this is strontium vanadate, which has the nice feature that um, there is a group of three bands, T2G bands, which are just around the Fermi energy and which are nicely decoupled from all the other bands. They're isolated. There is no overlap with any other band or any hybridization there. So that we can very easily define this to be the correlated subspace or electrons uh, being in these bands to, be, to form the correlated subspace and the rest of the electrons are then in uh, the, what we call the R space, the rest space, and the other one is called the L space. So here we would use, we can use simply DFT for the rest space and for the correlated subspace we have to use something better, perhaps for example something that's based on a model Hamiltonian like the Hubbard model. Uh, in uh, practice, there are m two main approaches for doing uh, first principles calculations of the Hubbard U parameter. The first is constraint local density approximation. Um, here, the Hubbard U parameter is defined in terms of second derivatives of the total energy of the ground state with respect to the, for example, if you want it for the D shell, with respect to the occupation of the D shell. Uh, you also have to subtract here a certain hybridization term or get rid of it in, in other ways by a more, more constraints, doesn't matter. Uh, this is relatively straightforward to implement if you already have a DFT code and also gives rise to relatively cheap computation because it's just DFT. But the problem is it's not very general. Uh, you miss a certain important um, uh, information about the Hubbard U parameter. For example, the frequency dependence would not be accessible. And also you cannot really calculate individual matrix element like uh, the Huns exchange parameter or the offsite U parameter or any other matrix element that you might be interested in. So all these things are um, allowed or is, are possible within the constrained RPA approach. 
Um, it's based on many body perturbation theory. It's uh, theoretically, or in terms of methodology, relatively close to GW. However, it is, of course, more expensive. But you will do anyway, if you're interested in it, you can do calculations during the afternoon session. So what is the idea here? I just wrote down here again the polarization function that we also have uh, uh, seen in the previous talk, uh, defines or gives us the change of the density with respect to changes in the external potential. It's a response function. And as I've already said before, it contains an, a double uh, summation over the occupied states and unoccupied states. So you can think of it as a summation over virtual excitations that go from below the Fermi energy to above the Fermi energy. But now we can classify these virtual excitations into excitations that happen only in our correlated subspace, like this one, the red one, or the ones that happen or that somehow involve the other electrons that are not taken into account in the correlated subspace. For example, uh, the uh, excitations going from the rest here into the rest or the rest space into the correlated subspace or from the correlated subspace into the rest. And in this way, by this classification, we can write the polarization function in, uh, as a summation over two terms, the PL, the red ones, and the PR, all the green ones. And the PR is, of course, the screening uh, of all the other electrons. I mean, we do that we, we want to eliminate the PL because the screening processes inside the correlated subspace is actually supposed to be treated within the model. If we did not eliminate them, then we would have a double counting. We want to avoid that. And therefore, in order to calculate the partially, so-called partially screened interaction, the hubbard u uh, interaction, uh, we uh, renormalize in the same way as before with the screened interaction W renormalize the bare interaction by the polarization function, but only by the polarization contribution from the rest of the system. And then in the end, in order to apply to a model Hamiltonian, we have to localize this uh, partial, partially screened interaction, and we do so by projecting onto Vanier functions. And uh, what Vanier functions are, you've learned about in the talk of um, Jan-Philipp Hanke. Um, so the advantages of the constrained RPA are listed here again. I don't want to go into detail again, but I would like to talk about uh, quickly about one aspect, namely uh, what actually happens if these bands were not so nicely isolated from the rest of the bands, if there were some overlaps or some hybridization. For example, uh, if you want to treat nickel, uh, in nickel you have uh, hybridization between the D states and the S states. You cannot really say, or you cannot classify um, uniquely these uh, excitations. And then there are two approaches uh, to tackle that problem. And the first one is, is our own. We, I just called it here projection method. Here we define a prefactor for each virtual excitation. We still run over all of them, but we, we define a prefactor here, PM times PM prime. Now, PM is simply the probability that an electron in the state M is also in the correlated subspace at the same time. That probability is obviously between 0 and 1 and can be calculated by projecting the state M uh, into the space spanned by the Vanier functions. That's relatively straightforward to calculate. We do the same thing with the state that the electron goes into the unoccupied state and the product of these two um, 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 numbers is of course between 0 and 1. So that's how we can treat the entangled uh, case. There is another uh, possibility that was uh, proposed a few years before ours, two years before ours, by Takashi Miyake, Ferdi Arias-Setjavan and uh, Imada. And they uh, did uh, another trick, namely they said, okay, the problem is the hybridization between the correlated subspace and the rest of the system. So we just put it to zero. They simply put to zero the coupling between the subspace and the rest of the system, and then all bands are automatically disentangled. We don't have that problem anymore, and we can just use the first formula.
Uh, both of these methods are implemented. We usually use this one because it's a bit more straightforward. Um, but in principle, you can use both approaches. And then you get uh, the res uh, results. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the Hubbard U parameters, or so matrix elements with respect to the Vanier functions. Um, here is an example for the D states. Now, oh, and, and M1, M2, M3, M4, these are magnetic quantum numbers going from minus 2 to 2 for the D states. Um, now, forgetting about this formal spin dependence here and uh, the frequency dependence, how many matrix elements would we get? Well, we have 5m quantum numbers, so we have 5 times 5 times 5 times 5, 625 different matrix elements. And the non-zero ones are written to an output file in the specs code called specs Q. This is a lot of numbers. But in fact, if you, if you allow for some simplifications, namely the first is that you assume that your partially screened Coulomb interaction is isotropic. And the second uh, is that uh, you assume that certain radial integrals uh, are independent of these m quantum numbers. These are called the Slater integrals. If you allow for these two simplifications, then uh, only 15 out of the 625 are actually different matrix elements. Sometimes in DMFT calculation, they further make a simplification of the electron-electron interaction. They restrict uh, the operators only to, to density operators, which have some advantages in the application of the impurity solver. And then instead of 15 different matrix elements, you only have eight different matrix elements. And out of these 15 or eight, only three are independent parameters. The rest can be constructed from them by simple, uh, let's say, linear combinations. <coughs> And those uh, independent parameters are also given at the end of the standard output of the specs code. So you don't have to necessarily look into this file. Uh, I put here a quotation marks, Hubbard Hund, because usually in the literature they're not called like that. They actually don't have really a name uh, to separate them from the Kanamori parameters here, but I've, we just use this uh, terminology here in the specs code. Uh, you can also go ahead and uh, simplify the Hamiltonian or correlated subspace, for example, for strontium vanadate, you might as well simply restrict ever, everything to the T2G bands. In other systems, you wa might want to create a Hamiltonian out of EG bands. And then it can be shown that uh, only three of these matrix elements are different and only two are independent. Then, as an example, uh, here you see some uh, the calculation or values of the Hubbard U parameter that we have calculated for the 3D transition metals from scandium to copper. You, have, you see two curves here. The red curve is uh, our calculated Hubbard U parameter. The blue curve is the corresponding uh, fully screened parameter where we do not eliminate screening processes that happen in the correlated subspace and you see the corresponding parameter is much smaller because you have more screening. The more screening you have, the smaller the parameter is, or the uh, smaller the interaction is. And on the right hand side these would be uh, the uh, Hund exchange parameters here, also the partially screened and the fully screened ones. Now, you know, some of these materials are ferromagnetic, in particular, iron, cobalt, and nickel are ferromagnetic. Also, in the structure that we have calculated here, manganese will also be ferromagnetic. It's a PCC manganese uh, with only a single atom in the unit cell. And there is a criterion derived from Hubbard, uh, sorry, from the hartree fock uh, approximation on the Hubbard model uh, for, um, for having ferromagnetism. So whenever this criterion is fulfilled, one would expect the material to be ferromagnetic. Uh, what, what do we have here? This is the, um, uh, the stoner parameter, I, and uh, this one is the uh, density of states at the Fermi energy. Now, for the stoner parameter, 
we can use a certain formula. This was published by Stolhoff et al. And this gives us the Stoner parameter as a function of the Hubbard U parameter and the Hund's exchange parameter, exactly those that we've just calculated. And then they say in order to account for correlation, that's a rule of thumb, one should reduce it by 40%. And if you now calculate the left-hand side with these particular parameters, then in fact we see that uh, for exactly those materials which we know are ferromagnetic, uh, the left-hand side is in fact larger than 1. So it, obviously the parameters that we, that we calculate there are meaningful. And we have also once looked at the Hubbard U at surfaces. So what would you expect at a surface if you have a correlated subspace right at the surface? You would expect that the screening is smaller because you just cut away half of the system. You have uh, only half the number of electrons in the surrounding to care for the screening. So you would expect the Hubbard U parameter to be larger. Oh, less screening, higher Hubbard U parameter. And in fact, this is the case for aluminum here, a simple metal. Also for rock salt sodium chloride, the Hubbard U parameter gets larger. And then it gets a bit smaller for the next layer and the next layer until it approaches the bulk value in the end. But that's not always the case, this uh, qualitative behavior for all materials. For example, in the case of BCC chromium, it's a transition metal, we see just the opposite behavior. The Hubbard uh, parameter is actually smaller than the bulk value. And that is because of a, an electronic, uh, um, electronic effect that is seen in the density of states. So in the, the shaded area shows you the density of states of the bulk, which has around the Fermi energy a minimum. If you are on the surface, this minimum is filled by surface states, and in particular in the 100 uh, surface termination, it even becomes a peak. Now, if electrons are there in surface states, they, have, um, they, they can very easily create screening processes that because they can wander around these surface states in a very efficient way. So even though you have less electrons, the ones that are there, can more efficiently screen your interaction, and this is why the Hubbard U parameter actually goes down. And at the end, I would like to show you uh, how this is calculated. Uh, this is just to remind you that was the procedure for the one-shot uh, one GW calculation. You have some kind of a, a job definition here, GW in this case. Uh, if you want to do a Hubbard U calculation, not much changes. You just have to change the input file, obviously. Then we use here screen W as a, a keyword. And all the rest is done automatically by the specs code. It automatically constructs the one-year orbitals. I mean, you have to define a set of one-year orbitals also. Then uh, if requested, it calls the one-year 90 library to maximally localize the one-year functions. It automatically also calculates this, uh, th this partial uh, polarization function PR. It calculates the partially screened interaction potential and projects it onto the Vanier basis, and then you get the Hubbard U parameters. So I've shown you for strongly correlated systems, you might want to go beyond DFT, GW, uh, uh, to include strong correlations. For example, uh, you might want to use LDA plus U, LDA plus DMFT, Hubbard 1, or what have you. And all of these methods are based on the Hubbard Hamiltonian, a Hubbard model, uh, which requires a Hubbard U parameter. And this Hubbard U parameter can be calculated from first principles using the constraint random phase approximation. Um, and uh, SPECS has an implementation of this uh, CRPA. The correlated subspace is then spanned in a basis, one year basis. And also, we have the possibility of treating entangled bands. Thank you. <laughs>